Oh, yeah, schedule's done. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Because, why not? Uh, I'm a power through this. Yeah. Oh, alright. So this is a talk about uh, converting 3D models into uh, ceramic pottery. So, uh, my favorite tool to use, not the only tool I've used, but my favorite tool to use is OpenSCAD. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this talk into five uh, ten minute segments. And uh, we're already late on the first segment. So. Some of you know about OpenSCAD. Those of you who don't know about OpenSCAD, this is going to be a real quick intro. Uh, OpenSCAD uh, stands for Open Solid CAD. It's um, basically a, a way of, of doing uh, computer-aided drafting uh, programmatically rather than going through and clicking and, and building your models up using a mouse interface. Uh, this lets you uh, do, uh, like, Basically, uh, put it. I'm going to say basically a lot because I'm, I'm starting to get nervous. Uh, <laughs> You're doing great, honey. <laughs> it's fine. Stop the wedding. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, free and open source, which I like, except when it screws up. And it's VRML esque, which I also like because I learned VRML as, as my uh, second language. And it's more like uh, coding than drawing. Uh, which is a, a that's that's different than say uh, solid CAD if you're familiar with solid CAD um, or or AutoCAD or one of those things where you you have to have a mouse and you're noodling around pulling and pushing and adding stuff uh, through the mouse so um, so this is kind of the the exercise segment of this where I'm going to actually stop the thing and go in and walk through the, uh, the process. So uh, solid kit, one of the uh, one of the neat things about uh, OpenSCAD is that you can really quickly uh, define stuff. So uh, what this is doing is this is saying build me a cube that is one by one by one. Uh, in, in every CAD tool um, and then we get to zoom in because I had zoomed out. In, in every CAD tool, or most CAD tools, don't have a concept of, of you know, a, a unit. They basically say, you define in your, in your post-processing what one stands for, what one means. So what, what we do, uh, because we're doing 3D printing, is we're, one is a millimeter. So, so the unit one is a millimeter. Uh, because we're American, we oftentimes can't think in, in millimeters, and so it's very easy to uh, do something like this, where you just define a variable, and then you can say, now give me a, um, yes, a sphere with a radius of an inch and then we zoom out and now I have a I have that sphere. Uh, you can also do some neat things like uh, dollar sign Fn. This is the the divisions that it's going to split it by so uh, you see how it, it uh, curls up you can change it to 180 and that'll actually translate over when you're when you're doing your 3d printing as well so uh, for if, if you want it to be real chunky then you can do something like this and that'll actually translate over and and you'll get you know uh, chunky blocks um, there's there's also the concept of um, of what do you call it? Um, combining thing, uh, combining uh, shapes together. So, if I want, I can change this to be 
five times inch to millimeter. And then uh, let's say set up no. It says you didn't specify a different origin point. Does that mean that the cube, the original cube is now internal to the sphere? Yes, it's actually floating inside this sphere. And uh, the, what I'm about to do is, is make it a little bit bigger so that it can be uh, seen. So, uh, so now we have a five inch by one uh, by half inch by one inch uh, rectangular prism um, that's kind of merging with this sphere here. Now, what I can do is I can then say this is all one part with a union command and what this does is this lets me when I go back and drill holes you're not going to see anything when I compile this but uh, when I go back and drill holes with this um, it's it'll drill through both of these um, objects together rather than if I were to drill through one and then another or and then the other um, drilling holes uh, through objects is performed with a with a difference function. So uh, I'm just going to change that so it doesn't look quite as nasty. <laughs> and then what you can do is uh, say C Y L I N D cylinder. And then so you can you can either specify uh, as as with the sphere I specified a radius. Uh, you can also specify a d for diameter, and and that'll you know change things. Um, likewise with the uh, cylinder, d equals um, an inch, and then you can specify a height of. Uh, actually, that might be too big, but we'll see. Of, uh, And ooh. Ah. yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> Good save. So one of the, one of the neat things about this is you can coming out the uh, the difference here and it should oh now my computer's just compiling all right huh yeah I think my computer is behind a couple of, of uh, compiles. So, there we go. That's the real issue. Say again? So that's the real issue. It's what? Like graphic. graphic. Yeah, it's, it's doing something funny with the graphics. This is what happens when you do it live. <laughs> Say again. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm I'm wrapping. Uh, I'm okay. So here we go. So what this did was this drilled that cylinder out of both the uh, the rectangular prism and the sphere. You see that? If I had not uh, made a union of it, um, it would have drilled out of one or the other. And it and and the way difference works is it will drill it, it will remove uh, 
it'll, it'll do a binary uh, difference from the, um, the every object defined in the in the block after the first block. So this union was necessary in order not to have the rectangular prism have a sphere cut out of it and then a cylinder cut out of it. You see. Yeah. So you can also do. Um, Show you one more thing that's fun, and then we're going to go on to more pottery related stuff. Uh, I'm going to swap this with a hole. And you can see it actually uh, drug the it, it, it basically did a shrink wrap around the uh, sphere and the uh, rectangle. The rectangle had been off center. On yes. It's not off center. Uh, it is. It's just kind of harder to yeah. see because the uh, you, you, you can kind of see it from this angle. Okay. But yeah, so, so hull is, is a fun thing. Uh, you can use that to uh, combine, like basically combine disparate things together. Uh, one thing that I've used it to do was make prisms. So uh, if, if you want to uh, like uh, make form right angles, you basically draw a, uh, a very, very thin or zero dimensional uh, rectangle in on on one axis and then the same on another axis and then hold them together and then that'll form a, a, a prism. Uh, you can also um, rotate them and then that that allows you to change the angle of the prism. So fun things. So going back to the slides. Minkowski, so that, I, I covered some of this stuff in here. Uh, one of the, uh, let's see, three printing positives. Oh, so once you've, once you've designed a, a thing that you want to print out and, and you know, reproduce as uh, pottery, uh, one of the things that you have to uh, consider is, is this thing going to be too complicated for me to get out of the, the plaster once I've cast it around it. And so that's definitely a thing that, you're, that, that you should pay attention to. Um, like, like I say here, the more complicated the shape, the more complicated the mold. Uh, this is a bowl, it's a very, very straightforward shape. I basically took something like this, set it down, and then cast around it, and then uh, when when the uh, the plaster had cured, I just pulled the uh, the original thing out, and I was good. This is a this is a one piece mold. This is a three piece mold. The reason it's three pieces is because there's a concave part underneath here that I wanted to capture, and so that meant that I couldn't just have a two part mold where it pulls apart without tearing the uh, the you know the structure of the 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 piece that was coming out. So you can see on this one, it actually you know, does that. So you see here, there's actually three parts. Um, so that's another thing. Uh, another thing to think about when you're 3D printing a mold is ceramic shrinks when you fire it. Ceramic shrink, and depending on how you mix your slip, ceramic will shrink in the mold. When you uh, when it as it's drying, so you can kind of see the the original versus the, uh, the the finished product. That's a pretty significant shrinkage. Uh, that can is actually slightly larger than a regular soda can, and I had designed that on purpose because I wanted to be able to fit ice and a shot of Jack in that. So <laughs> so that that is slight like that'll hold a a, a can of soda. And then it'll also hold a little bit more. But 
I had to scale it up by you know quite a significant amount. Um, so that's an example of what can happen if you leave your uh, 3D print to fate. <laughs> so another thing uh, to to consider when you're when you're uh, doing your 3D prints is. Plaster will stick to PLA very, very, very well. And so what we do is we uh, dip the, the positive into wax in order, because plaster won't stick to wax. So um, when, when you're printing this thing, keep in mind that if you have really thin walls or really delicate parts, you're dipping this in wax. And, and it's a thermoplastic, it's hot, it's, you know, it, can and will warp your stuff if you let it. So um, at, with this one, I actually didn't print a solid thing. I, I wanted the bowl to look like a bowl. And so I just made it so that the, uh, the wall was, was three millimeters thick when I printed it. Um, here's a picture of me making a horrible, horrible mistake. <laughs> I, uh, I, I designed a, a cup that I wanted to uh, uh, cast, and then I was like, all right, I'm gonna try a, a different thing, and I, I used the spiralize function on my 3D printer, and so it, it was exactly one filaments width thick. And so as soon as it went into the, uh, the, the pot of wet wax, or uh, melted wax, it immediately turned into gel. And and like I had to uh, print it as a, you know something I had to reprint this one because it just completely fell apart in the wax and then I had to fish it out of the wax so that was fun. <laughs> um, now we're okay. I am on schedule. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the uh, the actual casting the the plaster. Um, what makes a good flask? So the flask is what holds the plaster around the positive. This is, you're, you're gonna want something. Uh, we, I've, I've made uh, wood, I've, I've made flasks out of wood, I've made flasks out of, um, you know, as you see here, this was a, a gallon bowl from Kroger. I just cut the top off of it. Uh, oh, you don't see that, I see that. Uh, <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about. Um, so this, this was this uh, mold right here um, before it actually got cast. Um, one of the things that, that you need to think about it, it is, is how much plaster you're mixing. So uh, what you can do is you can do, you know, get out a tape measure and, and measure it. Uh, you also, if you've got, if your uh, piece is hollow, then what you can do is real easily measure uh, the, the volume of the thing that you're casting and then scoop out the volume of the, uh, of the material or of, of the positive or you can uh, take it and dip it in and, and uh, measure the displacement from that. Uh, you generally want to know what, what volume of, of, of plaster that you need. Uh, then what you do is you mix uh, three pounds of pottery plaster for every quart of uh, volume that, that you're going to be measuring or that you're going to be pouring and uh, the same <laughs> three pounds of USG number one pottery plaster <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I did that for Tyler just to hurt him <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you've you've seen this slide. Uh, basically, th this is this is uh, the, the the bowl mold that I made here. Uh, we we actually did two of them. This was uh, the other part. Um, I just took uh, gallon bowls. This was that uh, very sad cup. Uh, this was the second printing of that cup. Uh, where I, I dipped it in a lot faster, and so the, uh, the, the wax didn't melt it to pieces. Um, it's still not a good idea to uh, use the spiralize for that. Um, 
another thing to think about is um, so so this is full of air uh, and you're about to pour something that's much heavier than air in on top of it so you want to secure it to the the base somehow in such a way that it will not you know immediately separate and bubble up uh, that was another thing that, that has happened to me in the past was uh, you know I had to fish the thing out pour the water the plaster back off and then uh, reattach it before the plaster set it was kind of a panicky process that didn't happen this time around but that's that's happened before um, generally speaking um, it's it's nice to this is um, the, the plaster and the, uh, and the water that I was mixing um, generally speaking you want to use clay to attach things when you're when you're making molds um, because clay does not stick to plaster um, that sounds counterintuitive because you're, you're saying well I'm, I'm using this plaster to make it to to you know make something that is out of clay so you know I would expect it to uh, um, stick well that's what what the way the plaster works is it's pulling the water out and when when clay gets its water pulled out it t tends to shrink up and separate so uh, that's that, that works for us when we're doing uh, uh, you know mold making and it also is the mechanism that, that we use to do the slip, actual slip casting so if you're using wood then you're going to want to take some some just regular you know throwing clay and seal up the cracks in that um, on, on in the uh, corners and you're going to want to use clay to attach the uh, the positive to the plate um, as as you can see in one of these slides yeah here we are <coughs> um, so that's that's regular wet uh, throwing class or uh, clay um, let's see plaster really likes to escape uh, it, it being a water ba you know a water based thing it's it's almost an oblique uh, as, as you're mixing it it's it's a very fun thing to play with um, but if you if you don't get all the uh, all the nooks and crannies sealed with clay then it will escape out of those nooks and crannies uh, and because it's heavier than water it it has it is more beloved of gravity and so it, it, it will push more than you uh, than you would expect if you're just calculating with gravity um, but uh, so what we did was we, we basically just weighed it down with, with uh, you know some some heavy things in order to uh, do that oh here's a picture of where I didn't do that and it actually did escape so we actually the neat thing about uh, plaster is that if, if it escapes and you catch it then you can basically just push the the clay back over it sealing the, the the breach and then scoop it into a bucket and then just pour it back in on top and it'll it'll be all right uh, so things to think about when you're when you're making multi-part molds that uh, those those pictures were just of, of a single part mold things uh, is if you're casting in a flask what you're doing is you have this in a box right and it's covered up with with clay and you're pouring plaster in on top of it well <laughs> filming you doing that okay <laughs> so you're, you're pouring plaster in on top and then once it's once it's uh, set, you can you flip the thing over, pull the clay off, and then pour the next layer. And so that's how these two happen. Uh, in in the case of the three part mold, there was another plug of clay on the bottom that I pulled off and then cast that part. Um, do you have to put a layer of clay between the, the top of the 
floor part of the plaster so the two sections of plaster won't you you down. do want to do something to prevent the two pieces from sticking together because plaster loves to stick to plaster um, what what I use is uh, saddle soap you just spritz saddle soap I'm, I'm gonna hop back on okay sorry. you spritz saddle soap on it that'll keep it from blocking uh, I've also used uh, baby shampoo and that works just fine too I know for some complex shapes you have to you have to have the screws exit holes so the air to go out through both both clay coming in here and the air going out the other hole yeah that's yeah for for some really really complicated shapes uh, you like you you do have to do some some extraordinary things um, I've not done anything like that but um, the the thing that that you you would want to uh, be sure of when you're do when you're casting something like that as well is that you uh, De degas the, uh, the slip before you pour it too, because plaster will will seal up. Uh, it, it's self sealing. I mean, if you if you look at this, there's all kinds of cracks in this. But when you pour slip into it, it'll leak a little bit, and then it immediately seals itself because the uh, the plaster just operates that fast uh, on on the water in the slip, and so it's it, it forms its own seal around the uh, uh, you know, or around any holes so if you had sprue holes like you're talking about um, you you would not want them to be you know um, small because like because they would just be immediately covered up um, and so and and any kind of air bubbles in the slip that would prevent that would, would you know, stop that process from happening Go ahead. Are you degassable? Uh, the same way you degas, um, like uh, what silicon. You can you can use um, what do you call it? Um, a, a vacuum, or you can you uh, you can you can put a, a, a vibrator on it and and um, you know kind of shake it uh, to to get the bubbles to come up. But it's. Just as entertaining with silicon because um, you're on a time limit. <coughs> um, oh, yeah. Well, if you if you want to go, you know, old school. I was thinking about cake mixes. Mm -hmm. You can you can take a plastic bowl and just kind of drop it. And it'll and you just uh -huh. yeah. And it'll shake it out so you don't. If you know when you're just getting started, you don't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, 1930s. Uh, what what I what I did or what I do is I, I actually have a, a a little vibrating sander that I pulled the uh, the sanding pads oh, off brilliant. of and then I just push it on onto the bowl that I'm mixing the plaster in. and I mean 15 bucks from Harbor Freight. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. So so the the thing to remember for this is there was a plug of clay that came up as well that never got removed because I want to be able I, I don't want to seal this thing completely in clay or in, in plaster because I'm pouring into this and then I'm pouring the, uh, the, the excess out of this because I am forming a, 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 a cavity so um, okay I kind of covered some of this stuff. Uh, you can use Vaseline for keeping the, uh, the the two parts separate, but be super careful of, with the Vaseline because it'll seal the plaster. And then I, I, the plaster the plaster is working on the clay by being porous and pulling water into itself. And so, you know, even if it's around the edges. You're expecting the plaster to uh, to you know pull water out of the clay like around the edges. So it's better to use soap. It's better you know, like saddle soap or um, or baby shampoo uh, than than I've, I've used Vaseline before. It's like it it can be problematic. Um, after you've after you've cast the mold, uh, once it sets, 
not necessarily right away, but once it starts heating up, you like for for simple molds, you can just pull the uh, the positive out of it uh, right then, and then put it in the dehydrator. Um, you can use a, a warm oven. So this this was uh, that that cup after it had been uh, like cast. We basically took it over to a table saw and, and ran it through because it was sticking to the edges. Um, and there it is. Um, this is the dehydrator that I use. Um, it's it's a Walmart dehydrator. Uh, we we basically put a trash can on top of it and, and it forces air. At, like warm air through the uh, through the, um, the the thing being dehydrated, and so it works really really well because uh, you know there's there's a lot of moisture that has to be removed from uh, plaster after it's immediate at, immediately after it's been cast. So uh, that is kind of useful to have. Um, going to move along to the slip casting part of this. So once you have a mold, how do you use it? So uh, this is, uh, so, so basically what is slip? Ceramic slip is uh, regular clay that has been chopped up really fine and, and soaked in water and uh, it's, in, it's in suspension. Um, so there's two ways of doing it. Uh, the, the way I started doing it was I was throwing things on the wheel, and I'm lousy at wheel throwing, but I, I enjoy it, so I'm, I'm making lots of messes. Like, the, the first thing, the first noun I, I throw on, on the wheel every time I sit down at the wheel is garbage. I know this, and so I'm, I'm, I'm immediately, as soon as I'm done with it, I throw it in the, uh, in the slip bucket, in the, in the scrap bucket. So then, you know, once my muscle memory gets back up, and and the second thing is is slightly less garbage, and the third thing is is you know better than that. Um, but I, you 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 still wind up with lots and lots of um, you know excess. Uh, this is stuff that you're not going to be able to use again until you do something to it. You have to process the clay after it's been on the wheel. Um, so the, the thing that I was doing was I was just adding extra water to it and then grinding it with a paint mixer and making slip with it and then using it with slip molds. So I, you know, you, 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 get, you, you get to recycle. Um, I'm a big proponent of conservation of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that, so, so basically, when I was first making slip this way, uh, I wasn't using a deflocculant, and so, in order to get the uh, the, the clay to uh, be, you know, to, to pour it all, I was having to use a lot of water. Uh, otherwise, it would just stay chunky, and so um, that's that's why you you see this versus this. It actually shrinks about 10% inside the mold, and then the rest of the shrinkage is during the, the various firings. So uh, that's that's kind of one thing to, to think about when you're when you're doing uh, the the slip casting, or when you're when you're deciding what size mold or uh, positive to, to make is. Am I going to be using a slip that has a has a deflocculant in it? Well, I.e., I bought this slip online, or I, you know, went and did the research and, and mixed it myself. Or am I gonna? Be, is this just scraps? So, um, if it's just scraps, then you want to size it up a little bit more. Um, maybe add an extra, you know, five percent to the size um, to to account for that. Or, you know, if it's not, then go ahead and, and set the, uh, the mold to about, you know, just 10% because that'll account for the shrinkage in the, uh, in the firings. Um, I actually have a recipe on here for um, 
doing sl and other slip casting. This takes a little bit of planning because when you buy clay at, at say, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, in Michaels, uh, then you know they, they sell wet clay, and so uh, you can you can either throw it on a wheel and then. Uh, let, let your scraps dry out, or you can uh, chop them up and then let the, the pieces dry out. So, you know, that's that. One thing to think about is you, if you are soaking wet clay in water, wet clay actually is, is kind of hydrophobic. It's, it's not like it will absorb water, but you have to work it in order to get it to absorb water. Uh, whereas dry clay, is very like loves water it will soak it right up and it will soak it up to like to an excessive amount so if you dropped a couple of cubes of, of clay that you had dried out it will immediately pull up all the water and now you're dealing more with slip than you are with uh, uh, you know, basically if you uh, drop wet clay in, now you're having to uh, go through and, and kind of break it up in your hand and, and kind of smoosh it around until the water, until it dissolves in the water. Um, so in, in slip casting, um, the, the point is you're, the, uh, the, the plaster is absorbing water out of the slip, forming a skin of, of much denser clay on the edge, on on, on the uh, on the sides of the uh, of the mold. So, how long do I uh, leave the the slip in in order to form the thickness of the uh, of the vessel that I want? Um, is is dependent on on these various variables or of these variables. So, you know, if I if I have a, a amateur slip that I just mixed up from, from castings, then uh, it's going to take a lot longer for the, for the uh, skin, like the, uh, the, the walls of the uh, pottery piece to, uh, to build up. And the volume is going to drop. So uh, one of the things that, that I got used to doing was I would pour the, the slip into the mold and then come back every five, ten minutes or so and top it off because it's pulling that much water out of the uh, uh, suspension. So this is a picture of, or a couple of pictures of the uh, slip in these molds that we cast. Uh, here you can kind of see the, the skin starting to form. Uh, you can kind of see the uh, Oh, meniscus. Say again? I was helping. What, what was the word you said? Not meniscus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, here's, uh, I, I kind of topped it off and, and kind of wanted to uh, make it more obvious that there were a couple of layers of uh, slip making up the, uh, the skin. Then basically once you have the uh, thickness of the material or of, of the uh, vessel that you want, you dump it back out. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, that's like, uh, there's, there's no magic formula for, for slip casting. You, you basically just wait for the, the, the wall thickness. Well, I should say the, the, the magic is, is getting to know your slip and getting to know your mold. So uh, once you know kind of what, what you're looking for, you can't really uh, very easily measure without poking a hole in the, in the wall of the slip um, in order to you know, kind of gauge how thick it is uh, when it's at this stage. You, uh, you're, you're basically saying? Once you've poured out the excess slip, how much longer does it have to dry before you can remove the plaster mold? Uh, it that is also dependent on on the type of slip you're using. The the stuff I was using here uh, was professional grade slip. It it had a deflocculant in it, so it was much much denser. Uh, so there was not as much water, and so uh, it wound up working a, 
the, uh, the, the mold wound up working a lot less. It, it didn't have to pull out as much water in order to uh, build the stuff up. And so we actually uh, were able to demold the uh, uh, ceramic pieces or the, the greenware pieces uh, uh, like maybe an hour or so after the uh, casting. I mean, it, it happens pretty fast. Um, now that said, the, the amateur stuff that I was using, it was a day or more before we could safely remove that stuff. It took it a while. You know, I, I took a ceramics class in college, but it was all throwing on the wheel. We didn't do any slip casting. Yeah. Well, um, I, 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 I enjoy them both. They're, they're pretty fun. The, problem with uh, wheel throwing is you can show a bunch of pictures, you can show some YouTube videos, but unless you're willing to you know, reenact ghosts, uh, it, it's not really a, 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 a thing that I would bring to Freak Nick. <laughs> the hotel would probably not be happy about the clay puddles on the carpet. Yeah, that's also a thing. Um, that's, that's actually something that, that you really want to pay attention to if you're going to get into pottery in general is uh, clay is really, really bad for you to breathe. So you want to maintain a very clean work environment for uh, the, the, the pottery stuff. Um, because ceramic is, is uh, silicon based, uh, if you wind up breathing clay dust, you get silicosis. And silicosis is uh, like the symptoms of silicosis are the same symptoms of tuberculosis and it sucks so <laughs> like it it will stay with you a lot longer too it, it's not something you really get over uh, so keep like if you're if you're gonna do this then clean up spills mop you know it's like pay attention to your work environment uh, so that's this, this is after it had already um, sat and right before we uh, uh, pulled it out and then we, we cleaned up the edges and then we're doing some candling um, the the there basically there's a couple of different stages for once you have an actual clay body that you're you know a, a thing that you want to turn into uh, pottery um, there's there's greenware, uh, which means it hasn't been fired yet. Um, there's there's a couple of different stages of, of wetness of that thing. So leather hard is the stage where you can work with it. Um, you can you can take you know little knives and carve carve it pretty easily, and and you you can paint it with um, uh, under under glaze, and uh, you can do some neat things with uh, greenware before you fire it. Uh, then there's bone dry. Uh, what we did, what, or what I usually do with, uh, is I'll wait for the clay to get bone dry and then I'll come back with a wet sponge and clean off the, uh, the seams at that point. So with two and, and multi-part uh, molds, you definitely get to deal with seams. Uh, the way you deal with that is with a sponge at the uh, pre-firing stage. Any, uh, after that, you can you can still after it's been fired, you can go back with sandpaper. But now you have to deal with dust again. So you know, <laughs> it's just way easier to do stuff in, like in when it's wet than when it's dry or when it's fired. So once once you greenware or once it's greenware, uh, another stage before you fire it is candling. Uh, most of uh, most cheaper kilns don't have a, uh, a candling uh, setting and so basically when you, you put it in to the kiln you turn it on and it's on like it's heating up and your target temperature is uh, I think like something on the order of 1200 Fahrenheit I mean it's it's super hot now what that means is that there there is like even if it's bone dry, even, like it's it's so dry that you touch your tongue to it and it sticks. Super dry. There's still water in this thing. So when you fire it, if you haven't candled it, uh, 
the the water in the uh, in in the walls uh, of the uh, ceramic will come out because it's going to get hotter than the boiling temperature of water before like faster than the water can escape from the uh, pottery itself and so I, yeah. I, I can say not having having had somebody else make a mistake in the same kiln with some of the last fire. Yep. You try to fire it before it's all the way dried out, it will shatter. Yep. And it'll probably shatter pieces near it too. Yep. That's a thing. So um, like yeah, so so in order to prevent that from happening, what we do is we uh, we stick it back in a regular oven and we set it to warm or we set it to two hundred degrees. Uh, you, you don't want it to be you know, to, to go above 212, but you want it to be hot enough that you're wiggling the uh, the molecules of water out of the uh, out of the structure of the uh, you know, uh, the, the piece. Is that the candler? That's candler. Okay. So you like really fancy kilns uh, where where you're able to program it. You can set a candling stage where you say, all right, raise it to 200 degrees, leave it there for three hours, and then ramp up to uh, the, the target temperature. Um, with with cheaper kilns, like if you buy a kiln on Craigslist, unless you get a crazy deal, uh, you're gonna buy a kiln that, that is controlled by a cone, and that is going to uh, not have anything special like that. Um, so the candling phase is very, very important. <laughs> Unless you just enjoy picking, like vacuuming up um, ceramic shards off the bottom of your kiln. I was going to say for people that aren't into uh, candling, like I heard the term cone for years and never knew what it meant. I didn't understand that there was a physical cone. It had a right. Was it at a temperature? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I actually have a picture of that here. Um, well, can't see the mouse. Uh, right here, uh, there's. There, there's basically uh, three things that, that are sticking out. So there's a there's a, a bar that will will drop down when the uh, when, when the candle gets or when the cone gets bushy, and when it drops down, it's on a it's on a pivot, and it'll release a latch once it on, on the other side of the pivot. When it drops down, the other side raises up, and there's a little. trigger that, that is that basically is on a hook and when that uh, when that trigger raises it'll come down and pop and break the uh, the circuit and uh, cut off the kiln so basically that there there is a physical cone of material that has been calibrated to melt at target temperatures and you basically buy these cones at various ratings that's so when I say in this slide, firing to cone 07 versus firing to cone 8, that is what I'm talking about. The cone uh, uh, setting is the, the temperature of the kiln that I am that I'm or that, that is being raised uh, for the various uh, phases. So the first time you fire the pottery, you're uh, you're doing the bisqueware uh, fire. That's a lower temperature. Cone 07 is a, a lower temperature than cone eight, like by what, something like 15 state steps. There's about 45 degrees between steps. No, I think it's like 15 degrees. Say, okay, yeah, I've been checking. <laughs> I'm actually really close to being done, so I'm, I'm right on schedule. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the way it works is uh, the, the cone scale starts at cone 022 and then counts down to cone 01 and then flips over to cone 1 and then counts up from there to, like if you're doing uh, um, porcelain, then you're talking about firing to cone like 10 or 12 or something crazy like that. Um, our kiln only goes to cone 8, which is why I ever fire. Uh, cone 8 is stoneware. Uh, it's it's nice, uh, solid, uh, but yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're doing uh, uh, porcelain, it you you have to fire to a ridiculous temperature. Um, 
So, you know, you you fired to the uh, the go yeah. Um, when you said the inside of the kiln, it looked like there were a bunch of were those slots for shelves. Those are slots for the the uh, heating elements. So the the heating elements actually nestle down in there. They heat up in, inside the wall of of uh, this uh, of the kiln and then radiate heat inward. So yeah. <clears throat> Um, so you, you do the, uh, the bisque firing. What that does is that actually turns it into ceramic. Uh, it, it goes from mud to ceramic for the bisque firing, uh, but it doesn't seal it up. The, it, when you fire to a, a stoneware uh, temperature, like cone five, six, seven, eight, something like that, um, that causes it to, that causes the, the structure to crystallize and, and lock in. And, and it becomes a lot uh, denser. So you actually see more shrinkage for the, uh, the, the glaze fire than you do for the bisque fire. Um, then we've got some, uh, this is uh, actually a mixed bag of stuff. The, uh, the, the bowl in the middle, I kind of did a experiment with it where I, I cast this and or I cast it in this and then just Without uh, doing the bisque firing, I, I dipped it into glaze, recandled it, and then uh, fired it. So we'll, that was actually firing last night. So are you using several different types of slip there? I noticed some things are pink and some are green. That's actually glaze. So this is a glaze firing. That's going to fire to cone uh, to cone five, and so those those have those will darken up considerably. Uh, they'll they'll go from that kind of pink color. And you can kind of see this is a little bit of a, of a blue green. Um, the, the frog will go to hunter green. These guys will go to kind of a burgundy. Uh, and so, yeah. So, any questions in the five minutes I've remained? Sure, sure. <laughs> you did a great job. Yeah. Well, thank you. And you look great. I'd, I'd love to have a day with you at the shop doing this. Say again? I'd love to have a day with you at the shop doing this. Absolutely. I, uh, if, I, if you could plan it for a weekend, I would come from Nashville. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you are you on our general mailing list? I doubt it. Okay. Uh, I, I usually announce stuff like that in, in like, I'm, I'm not really great at planning. Uh, for stuff, but, <laughs> but yeah, I can I can announce stuff like that uh, in the uh, in, we we have a, uh, a a mailing list for the public, and we also have private our uh, members only uh, mailing lists, and yeah, uh, if you if you hop on uh, <coughs> what is it list at makerslocal .org, or list, list lists dot makerslocal .org, uh, you can sign up for the for the general list, and uh, it's it's usually a bot announcing events, but occasionally it's people hopping on and saying, hey, I'm going to do welding this weekend, or, or hey, you know, <laughs> clean up your mess. <laughs> 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 but, mm. We don't have that. Nobody ever makes a mess. What's the connection to the 3D printers? So earlier in the, uh, earlier in the thing, I was, I was kind of talking about uh, using 3D printers to make the positives. So this was 3D printed, um, this was 3D printed. We, we 3D print it and then we make a, uh, a plaster cast of the 3D print in order to uh, do the, the mold. Okay. One, last, one last question for yeah. you. Once you've used the plaster cast to make it, can you then dry it out and reuse it? Absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. Uh, uh, I've I've actually read articles on the internet. I've not done it myself because I'm I'm actually just now getting into the uh, the the use of, of slip that's been uh, that has a diff lock in it. And so uh, I've I've read articles where they said you shouldn't use your your molds more than like three times a day. And I'm like, holy crap! Three times a day, <laughs> like I'm doing good with with the amateur slip. 
as much water as I put into it, I'm doing good with doing it like once every three days because there's so much water that it's got to deal with. But I mean, I can believe it having having seen the thing uh, ready to pull out of the mold in you know an hour or two. So yeah, uh, you you can actually uh, it the, uh, the the plaster will reach saturation after a couple of uses, but then yes, absolutely, you can stick it in a uh, dehydrator and then dry back out, and it's good to go the next day. I was going to ask if you have you discovered like a, a level of detail where it's like you got your 3D printer and you made something that had a lot of detail in the 3D printer, but it just can't get captured in the blood? Uh, the the limit there is going to be that you're dipping it in wax, not that you're dip, not that the, the plaster can't take it. The plaster will, I've, I've, I've cast stuff where I was like, wow, I can actually see the ridges from the, uh, from the uh, 3D printer because I was using a 0.3 millimeter uh, uh, layer height and I just didn't have the wax that thick on that thing. So uh, yeah, it, it, can, it can pick up all the detail, for, like for, all the detail. For really complicated shapes, you can do what's called lost wax casting where the, where you have a wax positive that burn the burn away. We've done that for metal casting. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I don't think that's usually done for ceramic. No. Uh, what 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 you do with metal casting is you take the the plaster, you mix uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, playground sand in it, and then you uh, you can use it, you can cast it the same. Way. You have to uh, kind of candle. You, you have, there, there's a step there where you have to kind of candle the, uh, the the plaster because you're pouring, you know, hot metal into this thing, and so you you basically melt the wax uh, the wax out of the uh, the mold, and then you burn the wax out of the mold, and then you you raise the mold to the melting temperature of the uh, the metal that you're pouring into it. Uh, because otherwise there's going to be like a crap ton of thermal shock, and so you have to, you know, get the the actual mold up to 1,100 degrees if you're doing uh, what do you call it? Aluminum. But yeah. What? You speak the Queens. Aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say I'm done. <laughs>